Uh, well, good morning, church family. We're going to be getting ready to start uh, our time of worship this morning. Um, I just want to say welcome to Waterford Community Church. Um, this morning we have um, Pastor Nathan Randall with us and, um, and myself, um, who are different people than Pastor Josh and Matt Jolly, um, who you'll typically see uh, here at WCC. Um, Pastor Josh and, and Matt are both taking some time um, to spend with their families, to rejuvenate, to, to take rest in the Lord. Um, so we pray for them, that God would strengthen them and be with them in this time. <clears throat> I just have a couple quick announcements. Um, the first is Wednesday prayer meeting. That's going to be happening in person here um, <laughs> at 7 p.m. Um, so if, you're, if you have a desire to meet with God's people uh, for a time of prayer um, and fellowship, come here uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. <clears throat> the second announcement is uh, next Sunday uh, we'll, have, we'll be celebrating communion um, here at the church. Um, so as part of uh, local health ordinances, we have to bring our own elements to communion. So just make a note of that. Um, that next Sunday uh, service, uh, try to remember to bring your own communion elements so that we can partake in communion uh, together. Those are all the announcements I have. Um, actually, sorry, just one more. Just a reminder, it's hot outside. I, I don't think you needed to be reminded of that, but it's true nonetheless. It's very hot outside. If, for health reasons, you need to get out of your vehicle, because you're feeling too hot or overwhelmed, that's fine. You're allowed to do so. We have washrooms inside uh, the door here. And um, if you need to keep your car running and have the AC turned on, that's fine as well. We have the uh, service being broadcasted over uh, 106.3. Um, so that's all I have uh, to let you know this morning. We're just going to open up in a word of prayer uh, before we start praising our God. Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your church. We thank you for establishing and moving in the hearts of your people, God, to come together to worship you, to serve you. God, I pray that you would help us, help us to love our community, help us to love one another, and help us to love you, God. God, we're so thankful for the gift of what you've done for us by giving us your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. We pray that we wouldn't, we wouldn't get old of this, we wouldn't get tired of this truth, that it wouldn't become old to us, but that we would find joy in it day by day in every moment, that your son has died and has been a true and good propitiation for our sins. We put our faith and trust in this, and we thank you for it, God. We pray these things in your name. Amen. We're just going to sing um, a song, Open the Gates, asking God to come be with us this morning um, and to help us as we praise him.
next song is called All the Earth. And there's just some amazing theology and words that I love in this song. Because it tells us that the whole earth, the purpose of the whole earth, is to praise and glorify God. And as part of that creation, we get to engage in that praise and worship. And so that's what we're going to do right now. Um, this song might be new to you. Um, I hope that you have the words um, because the words of this song, just meditating on them um, and singing them and believing them, um, they're just powerful to recognize the sovereignty of God and his creation and what he's done for us. We're going to sing now all the earth. the Lord, all the earth, all the earth, bless his name, only one name, now and always, from the rising of the sun. Every nation, tribe, and tongue, all creation lifting up, your name alone we raise. You 
are good and you are just One name alone be praised From the heights and from the depths In every heart with every breath your name alone we raise. Praise the Lord, all the earth, all the earth. Bless His name, only one name, now and always. Let's sing that again. Praise the prepare for the message. We're going to rejoice in what Christ has done. He's risen. He is really alive. I don't want us to think about that as far off. That truth is here. It's so near and dear and fundamental to what we believe. Christ is risen. He's not dead. He didn't stay in the grave. The chains of hell were broken. The, the sting of death was eliminated because Christ defeated it. He has victory. And because we are joint heirs with Christ, we have victory in him. Let's sing together, Christ is risen. from the grave Christ is risen from the dead we are one with him again come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave
Pastor Nathan Randall, uh, at this time, to bring a message from God's Word. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for leading us. I'm um, probably not. I'll be thankful if the wind doesn't blow things away. Good morning, church. I trust that uh, you can hear me. Just fine. Would you open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17? I've entitled this morning's message, A Fishy Taxation, The Care of Christ's Gospel in a Shame Culture. Fishy Taxation, The Care of Christ's Gospel in a Shame Culture. I want to bring you this morning greetings on behalf of the Randall family. And uh, don't take it as rude this morning, but I have to bolt out of here. Really quickly, special day in the Randall home as our oldest daughter begins that coveted search for her wedding dress. So, you'll see me move lickety-quick as my life depends on that very fact. So I trust that you can open your Bible. My goal here this morning is very simple. Two principles from the Word of God that will help you as a believer live in what is called a shame culture. You might ask the question, what's a shame culture? Let me give you a two critical aspects of a shame culture, and you can see if you can identify uh, with these uh, marks. These come uh, from a book entitled, We Will Not Be Silenced by a Man by the Name of Erwin Lutzer. He was a senior pastor at Moody Bible Church 
in Chicago writing this book just recently, and he says two things about what a shame culture looks like. Here they are. Number one, slander and intimidation are more powerful than rational discussion. Number two, culture is being changed by coercion and force. Two marks of a shame culture. And I would ask you this this morning. Can you relate to those two statements? Is that what you see in the world that we live in today? My objective is simple to help you understand that that is what we live in, but also to help you understand that that's not new. And the writer of Ecclesiastes in chapter 1, verse 9 says this, That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Shame culture is not 2021. Shame culture is something that we as human beings have had to deal with from the beginning of time. Why is that? Why is it that shame culture is our norm? Well, a man by the name of Alexander Sholzelinsky, and forgive me for absolutely butchering that name, but he said this, and I think it's a bang on. He was a Russian novelist, philosopher, historian, prolific writer, survival of uh, survivor of the gulag. And he writes this. He says, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human have you ever witnessed shame culture? Have you ever been a participant in shame culture? My method this morning is to help you see and understand shame culture on the pages of Scripture. And as we look at this text, we'll see two marks, two things that you can apply this week in living as a believer in the context of shame culture. My text, Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 to 27. Let me uh, read that for you. If you have your Bible in front of you, follow along as I read. And they came to Capernaum, those who collect the two drachma tax, came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? He said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? When Peter said, From strangers, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook. And take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. We pray as we begin to handle the Word of God together this morning. Father, your Word is truth. Sanctify us by your truth. Holy Spirit, I would pray this, that you would lift the very God of gods from the pages of Scripture this morning to our eyes and ears. Grant us understanding that we might be transformed be your supernatural work in us as only you can do. Thank you that this morning you are tender towards us. We've been reminded as we sing, as we sang, that Jesus is alive. He has conquered death. The first phase of his purpose has been completed. And this morning we live in the reality of that and we live in the hope of what is yet to come. Our God reigns. Lord, I know this, that we come uh, in different places. We come wounded, broken, and weak. And what we need this morning is to see our God with clarity. So bring that clarity. Lord, as we 
meditate, as we consume your word, may it, it draw us into greater worship. May it allow us to leave here this morning with something to hold on to as we uh, move into the beginning of this week. We love you. Thank you for your truth this morning. Amen. Take four steps this morning. I want you to see the setting. I want you to see the set up. I want you to see the stumbling. Then I want you to see the salvation. So we begin with the setting. First of all, get make sure I'm on the right page here. Verse 24 says this, when they came to Capernaum, the letter Bible says it's pronounced Ephraim comes from the Hebrew meaning the village of Nahum. A small fishing village on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Reliable Bible dictionary says population of about 1,500 maximum. And for all you Waterfordites, 2016 census said that in Waterford, 2016, 3,200 people and change. So Capernaum is about half that size. Fishing village, but in that fishing village, a snake, a very significant Roman road, and it made Capernaum an excellent spot for taxation purposes. It was a Roman town where Jews and Romans Appear to have gone along fantastically. What else do we know about Capernaum that makes this location significant? Keep your fingers in Matthew 17 and let's go to a few other locations in Matthew. Matthew chapter 4, verse 13. And I would invite you to turn to that passage, Matthew 4, 13. And we read this. Matthew 4, 13. And leaving Nazareth, he, that's Jesus, came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Jesus, at the very beginning of his ministry, moves from Nazareth, where he was born and raised, to Capernaum, which becomes the center of his ministry. Why is that important? Because Capernaum has now been his base of operation if we follow traditional uh, timing of his ministry for three years. This is his third Passover in Capernaum. We'll see why that's important in a moment. Flip forward to another passage in Matthew. Matthew 8, verse 14. Matthew 8, verse 14. Where we read this. When Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. Not only is Jesus ministering out of Capernaum, but Peter and his family are there in Capernaum as well. Peter owns a home. He's married. He has children. He is a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee out of Capernaum. One other thing we want to remind ourselves of, Matthew chapter 9, very next chapter, and we read this, Matthew chapter 9, verse 1, and then I'm going to jump to verse 9. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. That's the city of Capernaum. Then in verse 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed. Why do I labor that? I labor that to demonstrate this. Jesus is there. Peter is there. Matthew, the very writer of this passage, is there. Incidentally, Matthew is the only writer that documents this event. I believe it was near and dear to Matthew's heart. One other passage we need to remind ourselves of is this, Matthew eleven twenty three. You can turn there as I read these words, Matthew eleven twenty three, And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? 
you will descend into Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. If the miracles that Jesus had done in Capernaum were done in Sodom, Sodom would still exist today. Jesus has been in Capernaum doing miracle upon miracle. And they have refused to believe. And so we have the setting for this piece of Scripture. I want to suggest to you this morning that Jesus is well known. Waterford, as you think about your own community, is there a person in your community that would be known by name or by face across your community? Branford recently making the headlines with his passing was a man by the name of Walter Gretzky. Ever met him? Followed his son very well in his hockey career, but he was known by name and by face across Branford. We have another individual in Bradford, Mike with a bike. Ever met him? Know him by name. My wife interacted with him on the street once. But you get the point. Jesus was well known in Capernaum. They would have seen him, they would have talked to him, and he would have been the talk of the town. So we get the setting. And we get the set up, the set up. Verse 24 continues, we read this, the arrival of those who collected the two drachma. In your Bibles, if you're following along, the word tax is in italics. It means it's not in the original text. But here we have a group of individuals and they're responsible to collect what has become called the two drachma. And they come. Before we move on, we need to understand what's the two drachma. What's the two drachma? I believe that it comes from the book of Exodus, chapters, or sorry, chapter 30, verses 12 to 16. We're not going to turn there. Let me give you the highlights. In, in Exodus 30, uh, the people of Israel are coming out of Egypt. And uh, there is a desire to take a census. And God says this, in the event that you take a census, all males 20 and older are required to pay a ransom of a half shekel to prevent a plague in the event that you take a census. No male over 20 was to pay less. No male over 20 was to pay more. Atonement money from the sons of Israel, and it was to be used for the service of the tent of meeting. Later, in Nehemiah chapter 10, after Israel is coming out of exile in Babylon, verses 32 and 33, we get this picture. The Jews uh, returned from exile in Babylon and placed themselves under obligation to contribute yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God was collected for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. So we perhaps see the origin of this practice. Fast forward 400 years, and in this text we have noted two drachma, two drachma tax. And the, new, the International Greek Testament commentary says this, it was provision made, or sorry, the provision was made for collecting this tax locally and sending the gathered monies on to Jerusalem. And the collection period was about a, about a month before Passover. So they would begin to collect this money locally. They would transport that money to Jerusalem where it would be used to service what had become the temple in Jerusalem. As I was thinking about that, so there's the picture. Jesus is in Capernaum, a tax is being collected, the season is just before the Passover. But I thought about this, there's, a New Test there's an Old Testament requirement for all Israelite males. And Exodus 34 verse 23 reminds 
because of that requirement. It says this, three times a year, all your males are to appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. Deuteronomy 16.16 16 echoes that. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God. In the place where he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's the Passover, and at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So did you know what the requirement was? All males were to present themselves before God three times a year. One of those times was the Passover. And yet the picture in Capernaum is a tax that was being collected to be carried to Jerusalem for the service of the temple. And yet, the men of Capernaum were required by the law of God to actually go to Jerusalem themselves. So we begin to get a sense of perhaps what's going on in uh, these moments. Notice verse 27 that the passage opens with tax not being paid, and yet it closes with tax being paid. Verse 27, Jesus says to Peter, you're going to find a shekel in the mouth of a fish. You're going to use that shekel to pay this tax for you and for me. And I want you to see this. Two drachma in the opening passage becomes a shekel in the close. Two different coins. The shekel that Peter pays with is a Tyrian shekel. The two drachma, which would have been the common currency of the time, was a Roman coin. And it had become necessary to take a Roman coin, convert it to Tyrian currency to pay this tax. And in order to do that, you had to go through what was called a money changer who would skim from the top of that transaction. So, these men come along, and I want you to notice this. They ask the question. They came to Peter. Notice that. And they asked this question. Does your teacher not pay the two drachma? We read that in the English, and if we're not careful, we can miss the tone. Notice that they speak to Peter. And the first question I would ask you this morning, is it strange that they would ask Peter about the tax payment practices of Jesus? What if I asked Pastor Josh, his brother Zeke this morning, hey Zeke, does your brother... Support the local legion? Is that not a strange question? Why would I ask Zeke? I remind you of this. As the question is being asked, Jesus is in Capernaum. He's available. And yet they ask the question of Peter. I think that's deliberate. In the Greek, the question assumes only one answer. This is what we call in the English a loaded question. Have you ever been asked a loaded question? What about this one, gentlemen? My wife comes to me and she says, Honey, how do I look in this dress? That's a loaded question. What about this one? Maybe a little closer to home. Have you had your COVID-19 vaccination? be a loaded question too. So we have this question. It's asked of Peter. It demands or it expects an affirmative response. The question is, is this a simple question? It's a complex question. Is this a question perhaps with an ulterior perspective? was the job of tax collectors to know who had paid tax and who hadn't. Jesus had been in Capernaum for three years. Why then do they ask this question of Peter? 
Has Jesus forgotten to pay his taxes? Isn't this the same Jesus who in Matthew 22 has this conversation recorded? And the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one. You are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they bought him, they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Hearing this, they were amazed. Leaving him, they went away. Why ask Peter when Jesus is available for the asking? Why ask the question when they should already know? Why question a practice that would have been established two years earlier? Why ask a question in a way that it demanded a certain response? I remind you of Lutzer's words. He said this, Slander and intimidation are more powerful than rational discussion. Could it be that rational discussion is not intended? Could it be that a friendly requirement, or sorry, a friendly reminder is not the purpose? Could it be that there is confrontation and hostility behind the question? So we have the setting, we have the setup, and then we have the stumble. The stumble. Peter responds to the question with one word, yes! Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. In the Greek, a strong, quick response. Peter doesn't hesitate. But why does Peter answer yes when at the end of the text we see that not only Peter has not paid, but Jesus has not paid either. Follow along, Peter answers yes, and then the text moves to Peter's home. The verse continues, it says this, When he, Peter, came into the house, his house, Jesus spoke to him first. Notice, Peter doesn't even have the chance to open his mouth. Jesus gets the ball rolling right away. And he says, what do you think, Simon? Now notice, in the previous verse, the men come and they address Peter. Jesus addresses Simon. Name change. We know that the name applies to the same man. Many conclude that when Jesus addresses Peter as Peter, it's positive. And when Jesus addresses Peter as Simon, it's negative. And perhaps that's what we're to see here on this page. Jesus says to Simon, what do you think? Of whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? Two Roman forms of taxation? From their sons or from strangers? Then Peter responds, from strangers. Of course, Jesus said to him, then the sons are accepted. What's this dialogue about? Notice the word taxation. You understand taxation. This morning I pay property tax. You pay HST. Some of us do. You know what it means to be taxed. We also know that taxation is not voluntary. If you don't pay your tax this morning, if I don't pay my tax, the government comes and knocks me. Taxation is involuntary. I think one of the things that we're supposed to see here is that the service of the temple had become involuntary. When a king taxes strangers, it's involuntary. But listen to this. When the people of God worship and they give, it is voluntary. 
It is a giving that's motivated by worship. I saw a number of you uh, walk to the front, give as you should in a voluntary act of worship. Not taxation, but a gift from the heart out of love and out of worship. Could it be that one of the, the contrasts that we're to see here is how believers are to respond to the act of giving? Kings tax, families voluntarily contribute. So Jesus calls for an exemption. I believe that Peter entered the home with every intention of paying that tax. Jesus meets him before he has the opportunity to take action. And we get this conclusion, and it's marvelous. Verse 27. However, so that we do not offend them. Pause there for a moment. We see Jesus concerned about offense. Worth thinking about what is the offense that he's talking about. But notice the instruction. Go to the sea and throw in a hook. Only time in the New Testament that we have fishing with a hook. What was Peter's profession before he began to follow? Somebody shout it out. What did he do? Fisherman. Professional fisherman. All right? He knew how to catch fish. Jesus, in this moment, gives him a very specific instruction. Peter, one rod, one line, one hook into the Sea of Galilee for one fish. Jesus, or sorry, Peter knew what it meant to haul in fish by the net. This is the same Jesus who earlier had sent, or had told Peter to put his net in the water after a whole night of fishing where they caught nothing. Jesus said to Peter, put your net on the other side. Peter did. And the text says they brought in so much fish that both boats began to sink. Same Jesus who in a few chapters later, a few days later, would cause a miraculous catch where 193 fish were caught. John 21. This is the same Jesus who one chapter earlier had caused not one feeding, but two feedings from loaves and fish. And he had made what was small, feed thousands. And it's this Jesus who says to Peter, take your line, put it in the Sea of Galilee that you know well, one hook, one cast, one cast. Think about that. What does Peter do? Well, the instruction goes further. Throw in a hook. Take the first fish. Doesn't matter how big it is, Peter. Take the first fish. Open the fish's mouth, and in it you will find a shekel. Not a two, not a two drachma, but a Tyrian shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. Here's the picture. Peter has indicated that they're taxpayers. Before he has a chance to go and make provision for payment, Jesus interrupts, sends him on the Father's mission, and the Father provides one fish with a Tyrian shekel in its mouth. And here's where we get a little additional insight. They would have paid with a Roman coin, they would have converted that Roman coin to a Tyrian half shekel to pay, and they would have paid the money exchangers for that privilege. Jesus sends Peter on a, on a trip, and he hands over a Tyrian shekel, which is twice double drachma, without ever paying conversion. Father knew what was needed, and he provided that in a miraculous way. 
the stumble was Peter's yes. The salvation was the Father's miraculous provision of this fish. And you say, how does that apply to you and I today? Let me give you two principles that I see coming from the pages of Scripture. First this, I believe that Peter, when he answered yes, knew that he was telling a lie. I believe that he was lying because of the pressure of the question. I believe that his motivation for lying was the protection of none other than Jesus Christ. No. And yet he lied. Let me ask you this this morning. Have you ever felt the pressure to lie for Jesus? Have you ever felt the pressure to lie for his church? Right at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the devil asked this question of Eve. He said, did God really say? God really say? Ever get that kind of question from those that you interact with? Loaded question. Designed to elicit a response that is either an outright lie or is a half-truth that doesn't go all the way? You understand what it means to face that kind of question and to be frozen. I believe that Peter, this is exactly what Peter experiences in this moment. He stumbles. Jesus rescues. Here's the principle I want you to understand. Does it seem right to you this morning to lie or to even say a half-truth in protection of the one who is the fullness of grace and truth. I believe the principle that we're to understand this morning is this. Always honor the one that is the fullness of grace and truth by answering in the fullness of grace and truth these questions that are designed to Principle number one, as we move into our week, answer questions that are asked of you, regardless of their intent, with as much truth and as much grace as you can do. If somebody asks you about the gospel, give them the full gospel. Give them. Principle number two, and it's beautiful. The action of the Father here to save. The fish sent by the Father with a single coin in its mouth at the exact moment that it was necessary. What do you need this morning as we live in a shame culture? A shame culture that seeks to destroy the character of the one true living God. Here's the answer. The pressure of a shame culture is shattered. Shattered. Deke spoke about the shattering of the grave. Here we understand a different shattering. The pressure of a shame culture is shattered by reminding ourselves of the real character. Real character. We need to be reminded in a shame culture that God is first and foremost a generous God who delights to meet the needs of His children. Principle number two. The power of a shame culture is broken through the constant reminder and exaltation of the full character of God. Two principles, brothers and sisters, we can walk in this week, fight the temptation and battles of a shame culture. Number one, tell the truth. Tell the full message in full grace and full truth. Don't shrink back from the question. Number two, remember the real character of God. Remember His desire for you and His promise to save you in all things. 
say to you. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gentleness of Christ, even illustrated in this passage, who was uh, gentle with his number one man, Peter, leader of the disciples. He handles Peter privately, handles Peter in a miraculous fashion. I believe that Peter, not only Peter, but Matthew, when he became aware of this, I believe that it shaped their lives forever. I pray this for myself and for your people. I pray that we would be a people of full truth and full grace. That we would look to the example of Christ. That we would live out the pattern that he has demonstrated for us. Holy Spirit, I would ask this. That you would reveal to us as we give ourselves to the truth of your word. That you would reveal full character One who has proven his love for us, Christ's death. The one who has given the great gift and therefore has promised to give all of the lesser gifts that are still to come. I'm reminding you. You are glorious. There's no shame in who you are. Help us to be a people that live uh, in the light of your countenance towards that the world might know, that the world might understand that you are love, you are compassion, you are mercy, you are everything that we need. In the glorious name.